Hello. Welcome to the Judge Ben Show. Uh, my name is Ben Joseph. I'm a retired Vermont trial judge. About once a month I do an interview with someone about a legal issue that's pending in Vermont. Uh, this is somewhat unusual again because uh, I usually meet in the, what is it, the town meeting TV, Channel 17? Yeah. I usually meet in their studio, which we can't do now because of the virus. So this is the second interview that I've uh, taped here in, uh, well Aiden, the cameraman, has taped here. <laughs> in uh, Battery Park and we're lucky again we had a beautiful day. And my guest today is Sarah George who is the, what's your official title? Chittenden County State's Attorney. Chittenden County State's Attorney, I should have known mm -hmm. that. And uh, how long have you been a prosecutor? Almost 10 years. Wow. Yeah, wow. January will be 10 years. Wow. And how long have you been uh, the State's Attorney, the head of the office? Um, three years. How many people are in your office? Do you know what I'm yeah, 36 people. Wow. Yeah. 36 prosecutors? No, there's 15 prosecutors yeah. and the rest is ad advocates and staff. Staff. Yeah. And actually, now that I'm thinking about it, it'll be four years in January that I've been in this position. Time flies. Yeah, it really does. When you're having fun, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, I recently did an interview here with uh, Karen Tronscott Scott, who's the executive director of the network. Yes. Yeah. Domestic violence is exercise. And as a follow-up to that, I'd ask you to come on so we could talk about what your, your office has to do with these matters. Um, it's really been uh, it's been very sobering to read all about this. You know, I've got, kind of done some background reading and thought about some of my own experiences on the bench. And uh, part-time, full-time, about 15 years on the bench. So I've dealt with some of these matters. Um, so your office, uh, do you have assistants who deal exclusively with these matters? Or? We do. So the office always has a prosecutor who is specifically assigned to the COOSY docket. And what is COOSY? COOSY stands for the Chittenden Unit of Special Investigations. And so they're a special unit within Chittenden County and that only deals with sexual violence and they are made up of specially trained detectives from around the county. And we also have a special prosecutor who does our domestic violence docket. So they are two, two dockets? Right. Domestic violence, sexual assault? Yeah. They do obviously occasionally overlap, but for the most part... I was going to say, sometimes they must overlap. Yeah. yeah. Well, r roughly, and I know it's, you probably can't put a precise number on it, but how many of these cases do you have in each category during the year? Do you know? Um, we get, so the FY19 numbers for Koozie were 350 cases that were sent to our office um, for either review or prosecution or both. Um, the domestic violence docket is um, a little harder to track just based on there being multiple um, agencies sending them, they're harder to track, but I would guess that they're closer to a thousand cases. It's a lot of work. It is a lot of work, and it's especially a lot of work for those two prosecutors who handling all of them is really beneficial in a lot of ways, but it is also a really emotionally jarring yeah. um, docket, and it's just, they're, they're complicated legal matters, and they're hard, they're hard cases to prove. There's rarely witnesses, and they're tough. Well, my experience suggested to me that uh, delays were particularly difficult in cases like this because there's often there's pressure on the complainant yep. to Absolutely. step back or change her story or stuff, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, now, currently, there's been a slowdown in the court system. Is that right? Yes, that's definitely correct. Yeah. And I heard uh, earlier this summer, I heard that they. Uh, there have been a ban on jury trials, basically, for a while. And the earliest summer I heard that they were going to start jury trials again September 1st. Is that still true? No, they have delayed that now through the end of the year. Wow. Yeah. So by the end of the year, will it mean you haven't been able to do a jury trial for a year? Close to it. I mean, the courts closed on March 15th, I believe, so... Um, Was yeah, that when the jury trial stopped? Yeah. So close to a year. Uh, you know, in Chittenden County, we're actually very lucky we don't have a lot of jury trials um, so and a lot of other counties have a, a lot so I do think that we're in a little bit better shape than some others but if we needed to have one right now we would not be able to so it is concerning well 
Does it mean in some cases there are delays in getting the case to trial because the defendant wants to have a jury? Right. Yeah. I just as a you know just as a, as a judge, um, having had opportunities to look at the Vermont Constitution, <laughs> yeah, which so. guarantees access to the courts. Yeah. I'm wondering here about these delays. In effect, there is no access to the courts. Right. Yeah, I mean, the Supreme Court did lay out some pretty helpful language and, like, um, the reason reasonableness of what we're doing and the public health um, safety sort of trumping, for lack of a better word, the, the Constitution. Um, but, I, you know, our office is very cognizant of that, especially the people who are incarcerated right now and unable to have a jury trial and are really working hard, especially on those cases, to make sure that we are really needing to keep them in jail or if we can come to some agreement or if the, on other cases, if the charges don't need to be pending, knowing that this other collateral consequence is so large for so many people right now. It is very difficult, yeah. Well, um are some are some of these people well some of the some of the people who are pending trial are incarcerated right and that's a problem in itself yep and then there are people who are uh, out on bail i take it and they continue out on bail because they can't get the trial right yeah i mean in, again in chittenden county we don't have um we have a very small number of people out on bail we don't i don't personally agree with bail um so I, we don't have many, but, and we certainly don't have people being held for lack of ability to pay bail. But we do have a, you know, a, a small number of people being held without bail on pretty serious charges. And um, those, from my perspective, are really the cases we need to be, like, trying incredibly hard to do everything oh, we can. Oh, yeah. Well, but if you can't have a jury, and the defendant clearly has the right to a jury trial. If you can't get right. the jury, you're stuck. Yep. I mean, literally, yeah. Yeah. Well, the defendant is stuck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's really, I don't know, I I was briefly in the legislature, and I remember talking about how there should be more resources available so we can get these things done. Um, I didn't make much of an impression, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wish I had, that, because I think it's yeah. very important. Yeah. Very important. It yeah. absolutely is. Well, um... <clears throat> What effect has the, uh, what effect, if any, I should say, I've got to be careful with my questioning here. <laughs> Leading. Yeah. What effect, if any, has <laughs> the COVID business had on your operation of your office? Yeah. Massive. I mean, it's, it's turned us on our heads. And I, I think that the benefit, um, I've really tried in the last four years to, um, decrease the number of people coming into our system at all, um, putting a lot more pressure on community partners to take care of issues that really aren't criminal court issues. Um, which how, do you, I, how do you define that, a criminal court issue? Well, like people that are just possessing drugs, and so their their issue is a, is a substance use issue. It's not something that charging them with a crime is going to accomplish. Um, isn't going to cure them, isn't going to get them the treatment they need, or maybe it will, um, but it's forced. Um, so, or uh, mental health issues, people that are only committing low-level misdemeanor crimes because of mental health issues when they just need a service provider. Um, just using restorative practices far more on cases that are between two parties and there's conflict, but there's not a lot the court can do to resolve that conflict. Um, trying to divert more cases through all of our diversion practices or all of our diversion services. So I think that because we've been doing that, we were in a little bit better of a position coming into this that we knew how to do that. We knew how to let communities handle a lot of their cases. And so we've, we've continued to do that. But otherwise, I mean, going from an incredibly busy office with 35 people you know, our county has over a third of the state's population in it. It's a it's a big office for Vermont to being, you know, having two people there every day and making it work with a couple days notice 
was a learning experience for all of us. I will say the court has a hard, has had a harder time adjusting than we have, but you do learn or you do really realize when you've had having to do things virtually how much time was wasted prior you know how much we really could have been doing much more efficiently that um, we are now forced to do efficiently and I frankly hope I, there's a lot of practices that I hope remain after COVID um, calling in for status conferences and not making the the offenders show up it's like I mean, you, you've seen it, how many people just sit in that courtroom for an hour at a time for a 30-second status conference, where now we're all calling in from our homes, we're doing other work while, we're, while other cases are being called. Um, private attorneys are probably not billing as much as they <laughs> used to be, but um, it's been great for us. The downfall is, you know, we can't do evidentiary hearings in the same way, and even but do you, do you do them remotely? We have been doing some remotely, um, mostly when we when we have a witness that we feel like really can call in or um, doesn't really need to be present. But it really depends on the defense attorneys as well what they're willing to stipulate to. But we have been doing them. The depositions um, in person are incredibly difficult. The court won't let us use any of their space, so we're having to find other spaces, and that is just sometimes. Why won't they let you use some of their space? They just refuse to let us use them. Um, they really have not been super helpful through this, to be honest. Um, but it's different. It's everybody, and you know, we have a lot of staff with children, so they're dealing with their own stuff at home, with yep. trying to teach their own kids and trying to figure out what their schooling's gonna look like and daycare issues. And so we're trying to navigate that as an office. And then we just, we miss each other. You know, we're a close staff and we're very social. Well, I and think, and, and, and you have to, you know, not, not being able to talk to a colleague about a problem yep. is, is very important. It is, it is very important. I think especially in work like this, to be able to, to talk some of this stuff out um, we do have a, a program called Microsoft Teams that we use, and we video chat a lot on that, but it's different than just walking into someone's office and being like, what do you think about this issue, and what should I do, what can I, or even at the lunch table, you know, having those conversations, I, I really miss that. Um, but we are adjusting, and I, I think given the circumstances, everybody's doing pretty great. Um, but I worry about the, you know, our system's already pretty dehumanizing, and I really worry about that aspect when we've gone so virtual that these offenders are not right in front of us when we're asking for them to be held, or these victims are not right in front of the defense attorney when they're questioning them. It separates us even more in a system that already does that too much. Well, I just think so much of communication yeah. is not verbal. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. you're questioning a witness. It's important to be in the same yeah. room and see how they're reacting and Absolutely. and what they are, what if, what affects yeah. them as they speak. Agreed. It's very strange. It is very strange. You know, when I was on the bench in Burlington the last time, I, I started what I call rapid referral. Yep. Yep. Referring people yep. on uh, cases involving substances, yep. put them immediately in some kind of evaluation and treatment. Has yep. that gone on? Yeah, it has, and actually, it's gotten. Um, it's gotten picked up statewide, so now it's in a, the Attorney General's office runs it. It's called Tamarack now, but yeah, it absolutely. I like rapid referral better. I know. I <laughs> I tried to keep that name just in our county, but then it got really complicated, and oh, so I finally you. gave in. But yeah, I do too, and you know, I think especially because people have no idea what Tamarack means, and yeah. um, it it doesn't have the same impact as like saying that this is a rapid intervention. This is like, we're trying to do something quickly um, for this particular person, but it is, and it's actually been a lifesaver for us. I mean, we finally got some really good staff in there and they're really dedicated to helping people and they, you know, give them, give them all the chances they, they really need until, you know, until they can anymore, but it's really great. Well, you know, I'm I, very thankful for it. Well. Thank you, but I, I just want I want I want people to understand that when I first started this, <clears throat> there was a three-year gap between a study as to what was going on and the first nine, nine or ten months of the, uh, of the experiment. Mm -hmm. 
and in retrospect, they found that of the people, the first 172 people who I put into treatment, um, about uh, what was it? 15 percent of them uh, got arrested again within three years. Wow! And then the there was a control group that the Vermont Crime Information Center mm -hmm. picked up. 300 people wow. who were charged with drug-related offenses, DUI, yeah. you know, possession of substance. And in that group, <clears throat> in the three years following their initial contact, uh, they didn't get treatment. So their recidivism rate was 80%. Yep. It's just... <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable to me how little we take advantage of resources like that because the data is, and research is so clear that the recidivism rates are massive when we don't address the underlying issue. We just try to punish the crime, punish the behavior without addressing the underlying issues. And that goes for substances, mental health, and trauma. I mean, just the m massive amounts of so you know, every person that's sitting in our jails right now probably has some level of trauma oh. and survive, like being a survivor of some type of um, sexual or domestic violence and that's just it's not getting addressed and so we and then we what, wonder why they they recidivate well I mean I don't I try not to make things too difficult for my guests <laughs> but uh, what 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 resources would you like to have available in order yeah. to deal with this well one I, I am a I am an incredibly strong believer in restorative practices I think that like you were saying with communication there are there's so many cases and I don't just mean low-level offenses I mean like violent offenses where so many of the victims just want to talk to the person I mean it, I'll give a, a really good talk example. to the perpetrator yeah they just want to find out like why they did this um, and and tell them how it impacted them and our system doesn't allow for that and and frankly, even, you know, the best example I can give of that is the Stephen Burgoyne case. You know, I tried that case. I, I dealt with those families for three years. And when I say dealt, I love them, like family now. Um, and they asked me that all the time. Like, can we, can we just talk to him? I mean, we just want to talk to him. And, and Did that, they want to understand what happened? Yeah. And that wasn't an option. Our system doesn't want that to happen. You I know, should explain for our viewers, the Burgoyne case is one in which the defendant is driving the wrong way right. on an interstate highway at a high rate of speed and he crashed into some cars. And he, he first crashed into one car that held mm -hmm. five teenagers who all died and then he stole a cop car and, and crashed again, um, hitting several other cars and, and injuring a lot of people. Um, wow. And yeah, so I think one, I just think that we really need to humanize our system more and allow people within the process to, to communicate in a really honest way without it impacting the, the procedure. Um, but I also think, you know, we need to do more within our communities to not call cops for everything and try to just resolve conflict and, and issues, substance use and mental health issues in our communities, let them handle it, and really leave those other, um, more complicated cases for the court. Because then we'd be able to actually handle them in a good way too. I mean, our our caseloads in my office are over 250, on average about 250 cases. You are- Per year? No, per, like at a at time. At that moment? At oh a time. Oh my God. And you, so you are, forced to triage your cases. You're forced to, and, and that's a terrible thing to say about people's, like you're dealing with people's lives and you have to triage. And we wouldn't have to do that if less cases were coming to our office at all and communities were just able to deal with some of those issues themselves. But we've gotten so used to just, you have a, you have a conflict or an issue, you call the cops. And the cops are so used to coming to that conflict or issue and find, figuring out what the crime is and sending it to us. <laughs> Um, we really need to break that habit, and I think if those communities had more resources to deal with it themselves, um, we, we would all be better off. Well, uh, mm, it's very difficult. I think, I think I, there are times when I think it, it's important to get the case into court so the conditions can be set. Um, 
to protect the public. Yeah, although, especially right now, like, they don't. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I think we like to Well, that's because that I do. retired. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> they don't protect the public. I mean, it's, you know, they might, if the person violates, um, right now especially, we're, we're doing citations eight to 12 weeks out. The person isn't expected to come to court because of, of the public health. I mean, if it's issues, citation so. for violation of conditions of release, it's eight to 12 weeks out? Yeah. Well, that's just Some cases aren't even getting set for a next court date, so it might be even more than that if the court decides to do it as a next court date. So, and also, like, somebody could violate a condition multiple times through the case, and it's just a new charge. You know, it's, it, it's, I do think it's important, I guess, you know, but I think it's important like an RFA is important. It's it's a court order. Uh, RFA is a relief from abuse order? Yeah, sorry. No, yeah. no, no, it's okay. We, we all talk <laughs> yeah, in acronyms. I know. Uh, um, you know, it's a court order, and for some people that matters, sure. and for some people it doesn't. Um, mm -hmm. And so, again, just sort of addressing the underlying issue is far more important. Well, what would be the best way to... Um, See, the thing that I always come back to is there's no best way to do things because yeah. each case is unique to its yeah. facts. Yep, absolutely. And so some some should go this way, some should go that way, but there can't be a general rule. Right. You know, there has to be a... It's, a, it's, it's probably one of the most important functions of the judge is to see what the individual facts are yep. and to try to tailor some solution to the facts of this case. Right. Right. And you can't do it by category, you have to do it by case. Well, and I think that that's, that's a good point, and it's an unfortunate truth in Vermont that our statute prohibits our restorative justice programs from dealing with domestic and sexual violence cases. And it's a, it's a blanket statement when in fact those cases have incredibly great outcomes. Why was that put in the law? I, I think that the theory behind it, and Karen actually might know more about this than I do, but the theory behind it is that victims shouldn't, um, that that's, this is a power and control issue, and so putting them in a room to, or into a circle to have this conversation would be unfair to the survivor. Is that That's my assumption. But one, the research does, does not support that, but also so many of, our, of those cases that we handle, that's all the survivor wants. And we as a government have said, no, we know you want that, but we're gonna do this whole other punitive thing that doesn't get you any The survivor that. wants to sort out the, the cause of this? Yeah, they wanna just talk to them. And yes, and especially in DV cases, I mean, you know you you've seen this like we charge a case and within a day the victim wants contact again they want to they want to go to counseling with the person they want to fix the relationship and mm -hmm. we say no you can't we're like we're stepping in we're protecting you and we're protecting your family and this isn't about you guys fixing this this is about him fixing his issue and it, it, in a lot of cases, it does a lot more harm to the family and the, and the survivor than, than good. So I think making these blanket rules about what cases, you know, we do a lot of nonviolent and violent for the same reason. And it's like, restorative practices work better on violent cases than they do nonviolent cases. But we've said, you know, well, those aren't really what this is for. And this requires individual judgment. Absolutely. It requires a yeah. judge. It really does. Yeah. You know, yeah. one of the most important functions of the, of, of the judicial role. Yeah. But it's it's frustrating because I, I really think you need more resources. I think that you, obviously the judiciary needs more resources. You could probably use some too. <laughs> you know, really. Maybe. I mean, I, I would really, I tell myself all the time that my function as a prosecutor is to put myself out of work. And I think that giving more of those resources to the community and giving them the power to really deal with those issues um, is where I would rather those resources be going than well, to I, the I, more I, I put them in both places. Yeah. Well, yeah. But if I you put them in the first one, you shouldn't need them in the second. You know, hmm. I think that... I mean, maybe, yeah, I, I'll take them, but I, <laughs> I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't pass it up. But I do think that our, you know, our... Our CJCs in Chittenden County are busy. Like I keep them very busy, and I would sorry, love uh, the community justice centers. Yeah. Um, I would love to see them get 
more resources. What is the Community Justice Center exactly? So they they deal and they are restorative practice organizations that. Um, I should tell you, I've cases. been on the board. Of the oh, you have? Yeah. yeah. They take cases from their communities and do um, restorative circles with a person. So they might have an offender. If the survivor or victim is interested, they will come too. And they um, they answer to the community, really. Uh, they, they tell them what happened. They acknowledge the harm. They talk about the harm. And then they try to figure out a way to restore that harm. And then it's the expectation that the offender does that, it goes out and does whatever they mutually agree will will restore that harm, repair the harm. It's just a very difficult, difficult area of the law. You yeah. know, I've had cases where a kid was taken out of the home because of violence, put back in the home and killed. Yeah. You know, and uh, that's yeah. just gonna happen. It is gonna happen, and I think we, even with good judgment. I'm not yeah, saying it's yeah, a bad no, thing. Absolutely. Even even though it seems to be the right thing. Yeah. One of the things I think often gets lost is this domestic violence is so harmful to the child. You know, oh, it's, the yeah. ch child grows up with this and becomes violent herself or yeah. himself yeah. later on in the way they saw the, the parents behave. Yep. Yeah. And taking the par like separating the child from the parents or taking a parent out of it is also harmful yep. to the children and you know, I did the when I first started as a prosecutor. I was the domestic violence prosecutor for about four year, three and a half to four years. Wow! And one, yeah, it was too long wow. to do that docket. But I remember the first time that even within that four years, I was prosecuting a father for domestic violence against a mom, and then prosecuting the son for domestic violence against his do his girlfriend. And I knew that that generational. Um, violence was a thing, of course, but to see it within such a short amount of time was really, um, was really heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And he was young, of course, I think he was 19, and it was like, what do we do to try to fix this now before oh, he wow. spends the rest of his life in and out of jail? And it's like, it's, it's really, and probably seeing his father abusive his entire life was a big part of that. Well, it's tra so traumatic for the children, and they, they live with it forever. Yep. And of course, if you separate them from the, from the parents, that's also painful. Yep. You know, I, I read a description of a case where the kid had been terribly abused, and so they were separating him, and he leaves the courtroom crying out for mommy. Yep. Who had been so abusive to him. Yep. It's, it's really it's that's heartbreaking. heartbreaking stuff. Four years of that? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. He paid a lot of dues. Yeah, it was... It was hard. <laughs> it's really hard. Has the, um, the, the the COVID business with the lockdowns, which have confined people to their homes, yeah. has that had an effect on the incidence of domestic violence? Yeah, it's a hard, you know, it's measuring a, a negative. So it's, I don't, the legitimate answer would be, I don't know. But, um, well, I'll take a little illegitimate <laughs> answer. Right, I'm right. not particular. All right, my illegitimate and un, really unknown answer is yes, I think so. Because our numbers of domestic violence have not gone up. Our, our cases coming in have not gone up, um, which at, you know at first might be a good thing. But I do, you know, speaking with some of our local partners, I do think that um, their calls are up. Um, oh, yeah. And so I think that a part of it is um, not not reporting and I think especially in the beginning when there were, we were on severe lockdown and it was cold and um, you know was, a lot of people knew that if they called the police that one of them was going to have to leave this home and they didn't have anywhere else to go um, and I think that's a legitimate you know concern and, and it would have happened and, and we had cases that came in that we didn't do the typical no contact because of that which is also scary um, as a prosecutor you you know you like I was saying before you want to protect them and oh, yeah. they're reporting and then going back to the same home that's always a really volatile time and um, when it comes to the sexual violence cases those numbers are significantly lower right now compared to last year which in part I think is due to the bars not being open mm -hmm. um, the colleges being closed down early and then you know, only partially reopening. There's a lot less stranger-to-stranger -stranger contact in general happening. 
Um, so that part I think is is good, but the the other side to that is what you're talking about, and like all of our mandated reporters aren't seeing kids right now, and so my fear is that children might be abused um, or assaulted at higher rates during COVID, and nobody there's no eyes on them, so we don't know about it. And frankly, going into this year, I think school counselors especially are probably going to have to be very, very cognizant about that one day a week they're in school or two days a week they might be in school, however their schedule is, to really pay attention to that stuff because there, there are eyes. Just, just, just to be clear for the viewers, what, what, what's a mandated report? Yeah, so there's just some people whose profession um, mandates that if they believe abuse is occurring that they call the police. And that, that's a law, isn't it? It is a law, yeah. And so um, school counselors are one of them. Teachers, I think, in general, are one of them. Mm -hmm. um, so with schools being out, and daycare providers are one, so without I mean, if a kid shows up in school with a bruise in his face, that's a, that's a trigger. You right. You've got to report that. Right. And so when you're not seeing those kids in person, yep. um, that's, that's something that I, I do think is being under-reported, unfortunately. Well, I just think it's, it's, it's so important to try to address this in earnest because it just goes generation after generation after generation. And you've got to try yeah. to address it. Yeah. Help these people. Yeah. I think, you know, one of the things that I thought when, when I was doing that business of putting people in treatment was they made a contact with a counselor. Yep. And I remember one of these people coming in saying, you know, Ben, it, it, she, she never came back. And I... I said, that's, that's really sad. He said, no, but always remember, within a year, I'll hear from her again. You know? Yeah. Once they've made that contact with a counselor yeah. who really cares about them and is not trying to lock them up, yeah. uh, it, it, they've got someone to talk to. Yeah, and you know, not to get off topic, topic, but I do think one of my biggest fears during COVID is our, is our suicide rates and our overdose fatalities, but our, our suicide rates are up. And I think, and a, a handful of them at least have been people with really no prior mental health history and telehealth has done really incredible things for people who are already engaged with a counselor but for the people who found themselves needing that support during COVID for the first time mm -hmm. um, you know I, I've been to count I've been to several therapists and counselors over the years and finding the right one is incredibly important and so having that first you know, session or, or meeting on FaceTime or Zoom um, is really hard to have oh, that connection. Imagine. And then if you're trying to talk about a personal thing and you're in your home and, you know, you're not in like a safe space, it, it's, it really complicates it. And I think that that is another um, issue that we've dealt with a lot during COVID is just trying to find people services that will work for them when they haven't been involved in them before. It's a very important function, but do you have uh, do you have the personnel to do that? Um, yeah, I mean, our we have really incredible pretrial service monitors right now. Um, that that's their job. So we do an order at the at arraignment, and that's all they do is connect people to services. How many of um, those do you have? We have three. That's great. Yeah. And, and they're great. Is that um, news that happened in the Europe Supervision? So the actual pretrial service program has been in place for maybe five, six, seven years, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. But for the first probably four years, we like in Chittenden County, we really didn't have great ones. And they need to be great. They really need oh, to like, really? they really need to know our system. They need to understand trauma. They need to understand, or they need to know like partners in the community. And we really struggle to find the right ones. But since we have, there are a lot of people that will engage in services while a case is pending. And by the time we want to resolve, they've done everything that we could have asked of them. Um, it's been a, it's been a lifesaver for us. To have and for the people obviously that they're helping um, to get them connected and then and for so many people it's just they don't know how to take that first step they don't even know who to call to get a particular thing or people just give them a phone number over and over again and it might seem like such a small thing for those of us that have our life together but 
for people that are really struggling with these issues, making that phone call can be completely debilitating. So to have somebody sit there with you and call with you and set up that time and then call you to remind you to go, um, that really like warm handoff is is crucial. Oh, that's, a, that's an interesting expression. Oh, the warm, warm handoff. handoff. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I I stand by that in general. People coming out of jail, I think, need very warm handoffs because we often just. Well, that's no, that that I you know, amen, yeah. amen. I just think that personal contact is very important, it just is. to be supportive. Yeah, because people you get despondent and self-destructive. Yep. You talk about increasing suicide rates. Yeah, absolutely. Or they go back to using a substance, or and then we're in the same situation we were in before. Yeah. Well, you know, you mentioned that Burgoyne thing. I'm I, I've studied that case a lot and. The guy's marijuana use was extraordinary. Yeah, it was like six times the THC content that defines inebriation in Colorado. And this guy was just unbelievably under the influence. And I just, I just think if someone could have gotten into, into that problem ahead of time, it could have saved lives. It's just it's a terrible thing. Terrible thing. Well, is there anything else you wanted to cover during no, our... No, I feel like we got through a lot. Well, we're, you great. know, I'm a judge on the bench. Yeah, so I know, I, I'm, exactly. I'm, I'm, we're comfortable I here. I like it. You appear in front of the judge, you do a good job. Yeah. Well, look, I want to thank no. you very much for what you're doing. Thank you. I Thanks know it's hard. Me. I know it's difficult. It I, I was once a, a special prosecutor yeah. in, uh, in a different world, and it's, it's a tough job. It and, is. Oh, yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. <laughs>